a committee member of AORA, and he was instrumental in creating the AORA for You app for the members. Beyond anesthesia, one can often encounter Dr. Murli speaking about other engaging topics in conferences such as work-life balance, mental models, time management, and my personal favorite, stupidity in medical practice. He is an avid photographer, and should you follow him on his Instagram page, uh, you would find some amazing photographs of nature and wildlife. He has penned a soon-to-be-released book entitled Think Like an Anesthetist, which a lot of us are looking forward to reading. Because he has such myriad interests, we could think of nobody else to tackle an offbeat topic as the one today on predicting post-operative pain. I'm sure Dr. Murli would provide an interesting view on this. Over to you, Murli. Thank you, Amjad. Thank you uh, for the wonderful and kind introduction. I'll uh, start my talk now and I hope everybody can see the screen. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning uh, to all the viewers. Uh, thanks to AORA uh, Executive Committee and Anastasia TV for uh, hosting this uh, webinar. Now, as Amjad has mentioned, this is a, this is a topic uh, which we don't often come across uh, when we uh, think about post-operative pain. Now, as I was doing a little bit of research for the uh, topic, I said, considering it's a regional anesthesia forum, I should include an image which contains some grayscale, and I found this. With monsoons well into its kind of third month in India, this is the picture I got from the uh, uh, MET website this afternoon. Now it shows that the clouds are across South India and we are experiencing some good amount of rainfall. But the more interesting thing is, when we look at their website, they're able to predict. They're not only able to predict what's happening today, but they're able to predict what's gonna happen in the next week. And when we talk about predictions, this is another important, interesting thing that keeps coming up everywhere we go uh, in newspapers and uh, news channels uh, when we talk about business. Now, the growth rate for the Indian economy, as you can see here, is uh, like a New York uh, skyscraper. And that should be quite comforting to all of us who own some amount of stocks. But what I'm trying to highlight here is people are predicting what's going to happen in the next eight years. But the most important thing is you'll find this wherever you go. Now, just look at this claim. Your complete 16th month life-changing report about career health, finance, life events, and also solution to a question and much more interesting mysterious revelations. So when uh, the academic committee of AORA asked me whether you'll be able to talk about predicting post-operative pain, I was just wondering whether I'll be able to do any justice considering there are so many different predictions happening around us. So the topic for this evening is predicting post-operative pain. I have no disclosures to make and the outline of my talk will be based on these key points. So we'll talk about the surgery risk factors which can lead to acute post-op pain. Why do we need to be worried about acute post-op pain? Are there any methods of prediction for this? Then a small introduction and a review of what happens when the acute post-op pain continues and becomes a persistent post-surgical pain and its implications. Now, when we talk about post-operative period, we generally limit ourselves to probably a day or probably until the patient gets discharged. Now, we are lost to feedback as anesthetists as to what happens to these patients once they get discharged. But when we think about post-operative period, we are looking at an early period, which can range from anything between 24 to 24 hours to seven days. And the main issues in this period is the pain that the patients experience, nausea and delirium. When we extend the post-operative period to a range between 28 to 60 days, then we get to see another issue, which is the psychosocial issue. So here, 
pain again features as one of the key things. Anxiety, depression, and physical impairment starts manifesting in this period. Late period of post-operative recovery is when it is from six weeks to three months. And out here, pain again features in a big way, physical impairment and depression catches up with patients. Now, why should we worry about post-operative pain, especially in India? Now, there are a few studies which were done in the last few years, and this one comes from the Journal of uh, JACP, wherein we looked at what's happening with regards to acute post-operative pain. And the study which was headed by Dr. Balavenkat looked at what's happening with the acute post-operative uh, pain and the pain service. Now they found that the current standards of care in post-operative pain management were suboptimal and we need to improve. And this again was a survey done across all the tertiary hospitals, uh, teaching hospitals in Maharashtra. Now I want you to just observe these two graphs here, uh, which say that the anesthesiologist who should treat pain on the wards was agreed by most of the surgeons and by nearly all the anesthetists. And pre-op pain counseling, is important was again agreed by nearly 98% of the surgeons or probably 100 and many of the anesthetists. So the pain which we are looking at in the acute post-operative period uh, is important. And we know that in our context as a country, we need to be working more on it. So what happens when a patient has acute post-op pain? Now, apart from just experiencing pain, we see some other interesting things which can lead to problems. So the issues of post-op pain are one, it can affect the wound healing. So the wounds take a longer time to heal. As we know, the lung function is affected, especially if it's an abdominal surgery, as you can see in this CT where there is atelectasis. It can lead to DVT because the patients are not mobilizing enough and other factors as well. It does increase the sympathetic tone, which can lead to other issues with the uh, cardiac patients. Late mobilization can have various effects on the patient's well being. They do often feel depressed or let down if the pain is not well controlled. And finally, it can lead to persistent post surgical pain. So, now looking at what are the risk factors, this is the main crux of why I'm here. The risk factors are important to, uh, it's, in, it's important to understand because we need to predict what's going to happen with our patients. The reason why we need to predict is we need to create an individualized treatment plan. We need to allocate resources properly. So we have limited resources, uh, especially in a busy hospital. We need to make sure that these resources are allocated to patients who need it. And we should be able to intervene early to improve the patient comfort and ensure that we don't see much of the issues with post-op pain. So what are the factors that we are looking at? Now, before I delve into that, I have referred a lot of papers uh, from the last 15 years uh, looking at what are the predictors of post-op pain. So one of the earliest papers which came out as a systematic review was in 2009, and they looked at the predictors of post-op pain and analgesia. Then we had uh, Professor Shinwas Raja, who was in fact the uh, head of the Neuropathic Pain Special Interest Group of the IASP, looking at the post-op uh, pain and also the pre-op pain perception. There was another review which came out about, uh, about uh, uh, 10 years ago, which looked at the experimental uh, data of uh, various pre-op testing. And a few other things which came out uh, again with regards to what's happening uh, with our predictions uh, regarding acute pain after surgery. So the main factors can be divided into the patient-related and surgical. Now, if we go into the patient-related factors, let's take age to start with. Now, most of the papers which have uh, been done uh, uh, with regards to age and the uh, prediction of post-op pain are skewed or we are looking at the data showing that younger age group patients experience more pain. Now, you might have seen in your own practice that this is true, and we need to be aware of this. The next is gender. Now, there is a little bit of uh, debate as to whether gender makes a difference. 
But most of the papers actually which have come out uh, have a preponderance towards younger female patients experiencing more pain. Now, psychosocial factors are quite important. And we tend to see this in our everyday practice. Now, patients who have a psychological distress, who are anxious, and who catastrophize about pain tend to have an increased uh, verbal rating score or uh, VAS scores in the post-operative period. Whereas patients who have information-seeking behaviors tend to have a decreased amount of pain. Now, initially in my practice, I used to kind of link this with the IQ of the patient, thinking that the higher IQ the patient has, the less pain they have. But later I realized it's actually the information base of the patient, which makes a huge difference. So they are well aware of what they uh, have to expect and they tend to have less pain. Whereas those who are not being informed enough and not counseled enough tend to have an increased amount of pain. Now coming to the preoperative pain, higher preoperative pain, sc pain scores uh, directly correlates with postoperative pain. Now this can be uh, again understood with a chronic pain perspective that they have an increased sensitization and this has been seen in numerous studies. Now, coming to something very interesting, uh, which I'm looking forward to in the next decade or two, is genetic factors. Now, we have been uh, seeing a lot of uh, genetic uh, uh, pharmacogenomics being spoken about since the last two decades, but we have not come to, an, uh, to, to, to the level that we can predict. But we are seeing two interesting enzymes, uh, two interesting uh, uh, enzymes which can cause this. One is the gene which codes for the ABCB, uh, which uh, again is seen in inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, this is a, is a gene which is uh, seen to kind of uh, malfunction, I would say, uh, with inflammatory bowel disease and the COMT. So the single nucleotide polymorphisms in the genes uh, can predispose patients to uh, experiencing more pain. Now, coming to the surgical factors, the surgical factors, again, uh, uh, multiple papers looking at what's happening with various surgeries. So let's start off with uh, ambulatory surgery. Now, this was a paper from uh, nearly uh, two decades ago, I would say, wherein uh, they looked at 10,000 patients undergoing ambulatory surgery in Toronto. And they found that orthopedic surgery patients tend to experience more pain then comes urology, general surgery, and so on. Now, when they looked at the different uh, uh, subset, subset of this, uh, they found that the orthopedic surgery, the shoulder patients were having more pain, followed by implant removal and elbow surgeries. Now, here we are looking at mainly ambulatory surgery. The urology patients, uh, the ones who underwent orchidectomy, experienced more pain, and in general surgery, the ones who underwent hernia. The other thing which came out of this paper was that the patients who were under anesthesia for longer duration had higher pain scores. Now, coming to spine surgery. Now, I couldn't find many papers except this recent one from uh, 2019, where they looked at acute pain and whether we can predict acute pain after spine surgery. Now, as you can see, the uh, set of patients were mainly undergoing decompression, then spinal fusion and other disc surgeries. Now, what they did was uh, something interesting, which I have not seen in many papers. This is called elastic net model, where anything which is red is actually something which predisposes the patient to uh, more post-operative pain. So if a surgery duration was longer, the patients experienced more pain. If the patients had chronic pain earlier, uh, they were uh, experiencing more pain. And they also looked at recovery room opioids, which of course directly corresponds to the amount of post-op pain. But the blue circles are, one was increased use of intraoperative non-opioid analgesics, such as paracetamol and NSAIDs, decreased the pain until the post-op day one and two. And men had lesser pain compared to women. And also using volatile anesthetic alone had uh, a lesser pain. Now, coming to breast surgery, uh, this again is a recent paper from 2019, uh, which looked at preoperative psychosocial and uh, psychophysical phenotypes as predictors. Now, they looked at uh, the breast surgery with regards to three types. One was the breast conservative uh, surgery, the mastectomies and mastectomies with reconstruction. 
Now, these two graphs just show that breast conservation surgery has got the least pain scores on uh, at rest and on movement, and mastectomies with reconstructions have more pain. But the maximum pain in all these graphs is on POD1. When they saw what were the psychosocial and psychophysical phenotypes, they found that independent of younger age and the procedural extent, that is the reconstructive surgeries, the effect, which is the mood of the patient and a greater temporal summation of pain uh, predicted acute post-op pain and opioid usage. Now, this is an important paper, which I feel uh, one of us, uh, all of us should kind of go through, uh, which was the role of regional analgesia in personalized post-operative pain management. Now, those of you who do orthopedic surgeries on a regular basis uh, would probably resonate with this graph here. That is, on the day one, when we look at the post-op pain scores, now this is without regional anesthesia. This is uh, patients who have uh, opioid as their mainstay. Shoulder arthroscopy patients have a uh, maximum amount of pain, uh, nearly rating around seven out of 10. Next come the knee arthroplasty patients, more or less at the same level, and the hip arthroplasty uh, around six. But what's interesting in this graph is you can see that the hip arthroplasty patients have a downward trend in the graph, whereas the knee arthroplasty patients tend to have a small dip on day one and then kind of have a plateau. Now, this probably is related to the physiotherapy that's undergo, that they undergo in the first five to six days. Whereas we don't have much data for shoulder arthroscopy patients, probably because they're discharged uh, most of the times on day one or day two, but they tend to have higher scores. Now, this is important because when we are doing regional anesthesia techniques, we need to be aware as to which surgery can cause how much amount of pain. Now, coming to total knee replacement in particular, now this is a nice paper which looked at predictors of post-operative movement and resting pain following a total knee replacement. And they found that if the patients had a higher pre-operative movement pain, they tend to have severe pain after knee replacement. So those patients who have an increased pain tend to have increased pain after the surgery. And they also did something else. They did quantitative sensory testing. And this is basically a one frame monofilament. Now, what the doctor do, was doing here is just pressing this monofilament on the skin and it bends at a certain pressure. Now, what they did in this study is they did this around the knee in var uh, at various uh, points which they had specified. And they found that those with an increased preoperative one frame pain intensity score tended to have a higher pain with movement. So this was with movement after the surgery. So it could be something simple that you could replicate in your day-to-day -day practice. You can use a, 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 a simple filament like this, uh, which is quite easily available on the uh, neurology wards because they use this for neuropathy testing and use it to actually assess the patient during a pre-op visit, whether this patient is going to have more pain after the operation. So this was the inference from this study uh, that the, uh, the pain can be uh, predicted by high preoperative pain and depression, and also that these uh, monofilaments can be used to kind of assess the pain. Now, caesarean sections is something which all of us do in obstetric practice, and we would have seen that the level of anxiety of a patient generally corresponds with an increased pain after the surgery. And also a patient who is catastrophizing, saying that I will feel more pain. I will kind of have this intense pain after surgery, tend to have more pain. Amputation of uh, limbs is something extremely painful. And pre-amputation pain, an acute thrombotic event leading to an amputation or a lower limb and a proximal or bilateral amputation tends to have more, uh, these patients tend to have more pain postoperatively. Thoracotomy is again another uh, surgery which is very painful. And this paper uh, looked at 621 patients who underwent open thoracic surgery. And they found that uh, pre existing malignant disease, opioids in the pre existing pain therapy, and antidepressant medication on discharge corresponded to higher pain in POD 1 to 4, whereas POD 5 to 8, that is post op day 5 to 8, they found that in addition to this, 
the epidural anesthesia, when it was stopped, tended to give more pain. So they have advised or they have recommended in this paper that whenever a patient with a thoracotomy has an epidural, the transition from an epidural to opioid-based analgesia should be trans, well, well, the transition should be smooth and there should be a protocol for this transition. So now we have looked at what could happen with acute post-op pain and what are the risk factors. Now we'll look at whether we can predict them. Now, quantitative sensory testing is a well-known method for assessing the psychophysical responses to graded sensory stimulus and is a well-developed research tool, uh, which has been used for uh, various studies. Now, what, what is done here? Now, they check mainly the mechanical pain sensitivity, as I mentioned with the uh, one frame monofilament. They can check thermal pain sensitivity with a peltier thermode. So this heats up and at the, at, at the temperature that the patient starts feeling pain, it is recorded. A pressure algometer can be used wherein it is pressed. And when it is pressed, depending on the amount of pressure that the patient actually uh, complains of when they feel the pain, the pressure is recorded. And also with electrical pain threshold, uh, wherein a electrodes are placed on the patient and the current is increased, the patient is given a small PCA kind of button to press when uh, he or she feels pain. Now, of all these uh, different QST measures, electrical pain threshold has been shown to uh, accurately, to some extent, predict the post-operative pain. And the systematic review which looked at these, uh, looked at 14 studies, and the variation was uh, quite wide, between 4 to 54 percent. So, the QST cannot be used on a regular basis uh, in, in, in our clinical practice. So we still need to probably fine tune this and uh, probably we might see it in the future uh, with regards to a tool for prediction. So this was another editorial comment uh, based on another study which came out recently, where again, they suggested that more evidence is needed. And because the post-operative recovery trajectory is a complex process and is affected by various factors, uh, it's difficult to predict only by uh, preoperative QST. This uh, is again something looking at the psychosocial factors which can affect and whether we can predict. Now, these are quite uh, popular tools which are used, especially in pain practice. One is called the HADS, which is the Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale. And any patient scoring above 11 is uh, uh, abnormal. Uh, so we tend to kind of see them and uh, prioritize them when it comes to treatment in pain practice. And this is a pain catastrophizing scale. So these are simple tools which can be used in case uh, we need to predict uh, post-operative pain and they correlate with the uh, predictions of post-op pain. Now, other interesting things which can be used uh, is intraoperatively the surgical pleth index, which is available on GE monitors. Uh, we tend to aim for a surgical pleth index between 30 to 50, uh, which indicates the uh, quality of analgesia that is being provided. And this paper looked at uh, this uh, surgical pleth index, and they said that uh, patients who actually required higher analgesic requirement uh, tended to have a higher uh, SPI uh, intraoperatively. So this was something, again, which, uh, which can be used uh, to predict if a patient will require more analgesics in the post-op period. Now, coming to something extremely simple, which I'm sure many of you would have observed in your clinical practice, is the patient who screams when you put the IV cannula might be this patient having more pain postoperatively. So, in this interesting study from Korea, they uh, said, you know, people were cannulated by the nurses, nurses rated the pain scale, and then the postoperative pain was again uh, uh, calculated based on uh, how much requirement of analgesics and the uh, VAS scores. And they found that the patients who did complain of pain on venous cannulation did have uh, higher pain scores uh, postoperatively. So this is something simple which can be used uh, in our day-to-day uh, uh, -day practice. So we have looked at now the complications, the risk factors, and methods of prediction. Now, what is persistent post-surgical pain? Now, it is basically pain which is experienced by the patient after three months of undergoing a surgery. Now, the reasons for this is, uh, one, the type of surgery. So these are all the surgeries which predisposes a patient for uh, post-surgical pain. Amputation, where they can have stump pain, phantom pain, phantom limb sensations, 
breast surgery, which we tend to see quite a lot of patients coming into the chronic pain clinic, thoracotomy with a, quite a higher incidence, especially when they're retracting the ribs and cutting through the muscles, inguinal hernia, and even laparoscopic inguinal hernia repairs when they use the tackers, uh, CABGs and C-sections. Now, persistent post-surgical pain uh, is caused by all the factors which lead to acute post-op pain. All the surgical factors which can lead to nerve damage, like I mentioned in the previous slide, the severity of acute post-op pain correlates with persistent post-surgical pain. And the phenomena of sensitization is extremely important here when it comes to becoming a chronic pain. And finally, as we have been stressing in the last 15 minutes, psychosocial variables form an important component. Now, the implications of post-surgical pain are that it can cause fear and anxiety, physical disability, reduced quality of living, depression and poor autonomy. So it is quite an issue. And as you can see in the chain of events, if we can predict the risk factors well, we can avoid a lot of these issues that the patients can undergo if not treated properly. Now, where, where do we stand and where is the future for the prediction? Now, we are seeing a lot of interest with regards to artificial intelligence and machine learning. And we probably are a decade or two uh, behind where the world stands today. All the data that the Google collects about us is being used for uh, you know, uh, machine learning and also uh, big data analysis. Now, where we stand with medicine is we don't have data. Due to various issues of uh, uh, patient privacy and other constraints, we are unable to collect data. But if we start collecting data about the patients and we have big data, we probably will be better at analyzing and predicting which patient is at risk. And artificial intelligence might be a game changer in the coming decade or two when it comes to predictions. And we are going to be looking at application of uh, mathematical, statistical, and computational advances, constructing various models, and improving algorithms in predicting post-operative pain. So just to summarize uh, what we have discussed in the last 15, 20 minutes, if your patient has preoperative risk factor for developing uh, pain, which can be a female patient, a young adult with a genetic predisposition. So let's take an inflammatory bowel disease, for example, having psychosocial factors and pre-existing chronic pain, preoperative counseling is a must and we need to institute preventive measures. If the patient has a higher preoperative pain, active management of this pre-op pain is important. So putting them on some anti-neuropathic measures, or treating it aggressively is important, which can be done with either PCA, for say example, a thrombotic patient coming in with nerve blocks or neuraxial analgesia. If the patient is undergoing a surgery with a high risk of developing uh, chronic post-surgical pain, we have to provide alternative less extensive surgery and prevent nerve injury during surgery. And various drugs can be used to prevent this into developing into a chronic problem. Now, if the acute post-op pain is well controlled with effective post-op pain management, then the tools we are going to be using is PCA and multimodal analgesia. And if the post-op pain is persisting longer than usual, we need to get these patients to early psychological counseling and intervene as early as possible. So considering that we are in a meeting of Academy of Regional Anesthesia, I would like to highlight the role of region analgesia in personalized pairs of pain management. Now, this is going to be the future that we will have to cater to individual patient based on how much of pain they might experience. So we'll be looking at patient factors, we are looking at surgical factors, and we are going to use our resources in a prudent way to ensure that the patients get the right pain management for their amount of pain. And with ERAS, protocols being uh, utilized and used in many of the places, we are probably going to see early mobilization, early discharges, and as anesthetists, with a knowledge of regional anesthesia, we are going to play a key role. Thank you. Thank you, Murli.
for that uh, rather wonderful view on predicting postoperative pain. Uh, over the last decade, we have armed ourselves with the ultrasound and uh, regional anesthesia has become more popular. Uh, it's just that we probably need these sort of tools now to fine tune uh, how we fire our weapons and definitely understanding our patients and uh, trying to understand their psychosocial uh, anxieties as well as the surgical procedure will go a long way in doing so. We'll take questions at the end of this, uh, the second lecture. Uh, I'd like to uh, call on Dr. Neha to introduce our next speaker. May I I think, unmute yeah. yourself? Now, yeah. Yeah, 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 unmuted, unmuted, yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Amjad. Uh, so now we'll move on to next uh, interesting topic that is newer drugs for acute pain management by our dynamic and vibrant uh, personality from Protocols and Guidelines Committee, that is Dr. Archana Arithi. She's working as Assistant Professor at Mahatma Gandhi Medical College and Research Institute, Puducherry, and she's a member of Editorial Board of uh, IJRA. And her area of interest are academic research and uh, clinical trials. So over to Archana. Good evening. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so Murli said that was an excellent talk. It's actually a very tough act to follow. Um, so good evening all. I'm Dr. Archana again here from Pond Pondicherry. And today the topic that's been handed to me is basically a pharmacology topic. Um, I'm going to try not to cover it like a pharmacology topic and more try to give a point of view and maybe an, you know, opinions regarding post-operative pain management. So let's move from the pre-operative prediction now into the post-operative management. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Is my screen visible? Right. Yes, Sarjana. Okay. So let's go on. At the beginning, at the outset, I'd like to say that I have nothing to disclose. And um, the only thing is that I'm a regional anesthesiologist. So given the option, yes, I will go for any regional talk any day. Um, right. So I thought this is very apt, this quotation uh, today for my talk. The Art of healing comes from nature and not from the physician. And the physician must start from nature with an open mind. I thought this is very apt here because most of our pharmacology comes from nature and nature we cannot predict, neither we can control. It is our tool, in our, one of our tools that we can use as, and we are the vessels that can use it appropriately. So my only request is please just watch and listen with an open mind Maybe some of it will make sense, maybe it will not. So my overview today is basically, I'm going to first just give a brief introduction about what is entailed in acute post-operative pain management. How do we approach it? Then I will talk a little bit about the drugs, the newer drugs that are available to manage, and then how they can be applied more so in the context of acute post-operative pain therapy. Now, at the outset, I'd like to just say that when I was researching articles for the, this particular topic, you know, it was, it was quite varied and so many different kinds of opinions and studies and reviews with various, a number of substances. So what I've actually just tried to done is I've tried to concise everything and funnel everything down into, you know, concentrated uh, majority opinions. Um, right, so let's move on. Let's talk about what is acute postoperative pain. All of you know the basic concept of post-op pain management is that no anesthetic is complete without a plan for postoperative pain. Now, even with regional anesthesia, all of our textbooks and any regional anesthesiologist will agree with this that no any no regional technique is complete without appropriate sedation. The same applies for postoperative pain management. Just a block is not enough. You have to have targeted, you have to have multi-pronged approaches, you have to attack it from different areas. 
you also it is very considerable you have to consider dynamic pain scores pain scores at rest are yes they can be achieved even with a minimal amount but it is the dynamic scores that are more important and more able to predict how well the patient is recovering the less the patient is in pain the better their recovery as you all know in this era of eras protocols and also we have to choose the best and appropriate management and drugs for with the most minimal complications so that obviously we will not contribute too much to the overall outcomes so we this is a very common uh, physiology diagram everybody knows the pathways of pain it's even though we know it's there we know it is complicated it is not easy to master there are so many intercommunications there are so many variations and also even in one single person in in a duration of their their life there is so much propensity to change there is so much so many pathophysiology that can affect it the outcome is pain but the cause is numerous so now everyone you know whatever the literature right now uh in the past 20 years or so all the literature is consensused on multimodal concept of analgesia what is the multimodal concept is basically you have this pathway and you're attacking it at multiple places so now as you know in general anesthesia surgery we do ra and then you know you give just the ra or you give just the nsa it's a systemic analgesic relief yes we do have good pain outcomes yes the pain is you know reduced from nothing to okay some amount but when you actually combine techniques your outcomes are amazing and you have a bright and sunny future your patients are happy and you are happy that your techniques are helping and your outcomes are overall in general better so this is the way to go and this is the general consensus of everyone and and any search and no person i've come across a medical date has you know argued with this concept one way or another it's followed so now with this background let's go and look into the newer pharmacology of drugs in order to know what's new i was very curious to find out where we started what's actually changed over time and what have we finally arrived at so basically the biggest impact on to human kind was the poppy this plant this particular plant that you're seeing on your screen right now it's the poppy plant the it's also called poppyferus omniferus as all of us must know and you know it's the base of so much of controversy but this is where it all started so now just to go through a brief evolution of where we all came from in terms of acute post operative pain management or peri operative pain management you know we started with opm so this dates back almost to 1500 bc so this is quite you know old quite quite archived quite archaeological so all these uh, they believed in the poppy they believed in opm do you know whether it was recreational or treatment even though there was taboo some places there was none but they used it it is quite interesting to note that even though we don't use the very raw form today in terms of pain management we are still quite heavily reliant on on opioids and narcotics right right through up until the 19th century when we started getting refined opioids so we all know about the morphine and then the fentanyl that's come later on in the 20th century and then so but then you know it is human nature to go a little overboard so in with the this miraculous drug but then you also have the other sad aspect of the endemic of the opioids and the opioid abuse so then again in the beginning of the 20th century people started discovering you know aspirin and the anti inflammatory effects that it has so basically it is from willow bark and then from aspirin it has gone on to so in the early 20th century they used to be called aspirin like medications now we know them as non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs so based on the cox1 the cox enzymes inhibition right so we are all very familiar with all these things and or oh, it's only in the 20th century that you know they've started applying all these things to post operative pain management to surgical pain management and now we are all in the consensus that yes all of these are required for a multimodal analgesia and generally everything is there so this is how we've come 
So these are the commonly used drugs. I'm pretty sure the list is probably bigger, but I use the, the ones, you know, in the very top of the tiers. And of course, we can never forget paracetamol. It's our best friend in, in any time, anything. It's used and it's safe, you know, apart from the very few likelihood and risks that it has. So let's move on to the newer analgesic drugs. What are, are they? So now when it comes to this concept, there are two different concepts. There are the drugs that actually give or supplement with the pain relief, relief itself. So when given alone, they do cause pain relief. But then there are the separate class of drugs that are basically called co-analgesics. I'll not call them adjuvants here. We called co-analgesics. That is when given on their own, they cannot produce enough analgesia that will take care of post-operative pain. But they have been proven to help or reduce the things that cause the pain, that is the inflammation, the oxidation stress, or all these sort of, um, you know, minute factors that are contributory to the, you know, overall uh, outlay and outlook of acute pain. So when it came to newer analgesic drugs, the list really isn't that long. You know, this is a common drug that actually nowadays it's, it's you know, coming up and people are looking at it and, and when they're looking at alternative drugs and that's the pentadol tablets. So it's only available in a tablet form. Uh, as much as I could look for it, I could not find any other kind of, uh, you know, route of administration. Basically, it is a centrally acting mu opioid receptor. You know, it acts at the mu opioid receptors as well as it is a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So it is, this is how it differs from tramadol. So it's not just, a, you know, another version. You know, it, it's, it is different a little bit. But however, it is less post potent than morphine and tramadol put together. And it has, even though it has a lesser affinity, it's, it's not really correlating to the amount of effect. So it's just about three times less than morphine. So in, in, in a chronic setting or, you know, they found it is acceptable and it has a comparable efficacy. The benefit was that it was not addictive, right? And it also has a safer side effect profile. So now not a lot of studies in the context of acute pain management in, in an operative setting, um, but I, as I've been made aware, there are several studies that are undergoing by the surgery side and also from our side. And I hope that future can tell us what is the dosage and how we can use this, whether we use it pre-op, whether we can use it post-op, in what conditions you know, we can or cannot use it. So maybe in future in, in coming up, we can actually better apply this to others. So this is a potential analgesic drug. The other analgesic drug, we know, okay, this is not a new drug, it's fentanyl, but the newer application of fentanyl, right? So it's basically a transmucosal release formulation that is, you know, it, it is, there are oral preparations, there are buccal preparations or nasal preparations, and it's available as disintegrating or dispersible tablets, um, soluble films like jelly-like films where you can just apply it to the buccal mucosa. And also there are uh, spray formulations that you can spray. So this is the same old drug, not a new drug, but it's a different kind of a formulation and a different application in a root form, right? So in terms of analgesics, these are the only ones that I could actually find as, as you know, that can be analgesics on their own, supplementing a as a part of a multimodal regimen. When it came to co-analgesics, they were actually a little bit more drugs that I could find. So number one, um, these are, again, this is not a new drug. We know this drug. It is established, these alpha-2 delta modulators or anticonvulsants, that is gabapentin and pregabalin. They are established in chronic neuropathic pains. And, uh, you know, they, they have their protocols, how to use them, how to up the dose, how to lower the dose. But when it came to acute post-operative pain, again, it was... It's, it's good in theory, you know, it, it should help, especially with the reduction in the incidence of chronic post-surgical pain. But immediate post-op, no, I couldn't find any much literary consensus regarding what dose to start, when to start, how long to continue. Um, you know, it, it, there were quite a few opinions and nothing was really done the right that I could say, yes, this can do it and this really does help. There is a, a little bit of data, but you know we still need a lot more, and there's a lot of way to go in terms of acute postoperative pain when it comes to gabapentin or pregabalin. The other one is ketamine. 
Now, we know this as a dissociative anesthetic. And yes, on its own, it can cause analgesia, but it is only at the anesthetic dosages when you use it. So apart from the anesthetic usages, it is used in chronic pain states like phantom limb or chronic regional pain complexes. And it has been successfully used there in, in order to, you know, where the dissociative anesthesia and also the neuromodulation. So basically what it does is it reduces the level of sensitization and modulates basically the wind up phenomenon. And that is how they believe that it helps. Um, in a perioperative setting, the, the concept of preemptive analgesia, that is where sub-anesthetic dosages of this, of ketamine, has actually reduced the requirement of narcotic and also post-operative pain scores are reduced, is what is the claim. But again, there's not that much conclusive evidence and the studies that are present are, you know, some say yes, some say no. So there's something we really need to look at it, you know, in a much, much more detailed way. The next class of drugs is the alpha-2 agonists. Now, this has been, this is one of my favorite drugs to use. I, I use it as much as I can, as, as much as possible. And uh, dexmedetomidin, right? So at the dosage that is prescribed, it, it is known to blunt centrally sympathetic responses, right? And it has known to reduce the need for opioids and also the inhalational agent or during surgery. And it also has this wonderful effect where it enhances the local anesthetic that is used during a regional block. So whether given IV, whichever route, I prefer to give an intravenous route rather than any other kind of route. And uh, I found that it's, it works very well and it, it also gives procedural sedation. But in a setting of post-operative pain, now I can give this pre-operatively or you know, along with my anesthetic, but how much do I continue it into the post-op? Do I give it again? So those sort of questions again, unanswered, uninvestigated, maybe we should be looking at it. How long can we continue it? Again, is a big question mark, but it does enhance at least on the first post-operative day. So day zero, yes, there is good outcomes. The long-term outcomes, obviously, we need to further investigate and the application specific to perioperative pain. So this is an interesting combination of drugs that is melatonin and vitamin C. Melatonin is basically, it's, it's the pigment in our skin. It's, it's a normal and naturally occurring hormone. Okay, it is produced by the pineal gland and it plays an important role, especially for our own circadian rhythm. So it's known as a chronobiotic that it, it basically adjusts your in, you know, time balance in, inside your system. And it has been known to be used in chronic pain situations and also for sleep disorders. And of course, for traveling to prevent jet lag. It's known to have antioxidant and anxiolytic properties and enhancing analgesic effects of other agents. But again, inconclusive, only few studies are there that have actually prospectively reviewed it. And so the recommended dosages is, it's quite you know, flexible with that. The other thing is vitamin C. Now vitamin C, we all know, especially with this COVID pandemic, it's been highlighted quite a bit where you all know it's a strong antioxidant properties and it's very neuroprotective, right? But it also has neuromodulation effects. So in terms of pain management, maybe it will not work alone, but obviously in the oxidative stress of surgery, if it can reduce the oxidative stress, obviously, which is a major contributor to pain, possibly we have a, you know, a nice co-analgesic where we can include it into the regimen and it will not only, it will also improve healing along with you know, the benefit of better pain management. But again, this is a hypothesis, this is a theory. It has to be looked at in detail, right? So these are, these are the more number of drugs. These are the, 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 you know, the, funnel, the tunnel drugs that I could find and uh, could actually review and you know, with confidence tell you that yes, these are quite a possibility that we can add into a regimen. But really, if you ask the big questions, which one should I use? When can I use it? How much should I use? Well, to really give you an answer, I, I, the literature is not really in a one consensus in, in one stand, or at least it's not enough to make strong recommendations to add it to existing standard protocols. 
that has to be based on experience. It has to be individualized. So we definitely, in our speciality, need more experience with this, need more prospective trials, need more reviews, and uh, definitely required to enhance multimodal analgesia systems. Um, so that being said, to, to just bring an overall end to my uh, talk today, new does not necessarily replace the old. This is what I've learned when I researched for this topic. So all of our old techniques, they stand through the test of time and they're still going strong. So anything that comes now is, you know, unless it really doesn't have any side effects, it might not replace it, but that's yet to be seen. So this is what is the open mind that we have to keep our mind very open to newer classifications of drugs, newer alternative therapies, and not just heavily rely on pharmacology. And we do need to sift through the many, many options that are available and weigh the risk and see how beneficial they are to your patient population. So apart from this, everyone, once you have your experience, please do share it because that just enhances the strength of our knowledge and the background of our speciality. So proud to be an anesthesiologist and interested in regional anesthesia. I thank you so much for listening and I will now hand it back to the moderators to conduct the rest of the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Archana, uh, for the great talk. And uh, yes, as such, uh, for the newer agents, not much consensus and not much evidence is there. So, uh, Dr. Ranjit, in the question section, uh, will you start with Murli, sir? Uh, yeah, so we can do that. Murli, I have a question for you. Yes, please. You mentioned that GE monitor that actually measures SPI. the possibility of pain. Yeah. Could you tell us a little more about it? Well, it's something which uh, we started using in the last few years. And when uh, we started using the monitor, I was quite uh, inquisitive as to what this tool is. So it's a complex algorithm which uh, works basically uh, looking at the heart rate, the blood pressure. So if, you're, if you have used this, you'll realize that whenever uh, a surgical incision is done, you will see that the SPI number goes up. And uh, what this study, which I quoted, uh, they did was they actually uh, took patients undergoing gastrectomy. They did not give them analgesics at induction, which was quite surprising as to how they got through the ethics, but they kept a sevoflurane uh, concentration of close to 3%, and which was the uh, MAC for the, the barring the, you know, the sympathetic response. And at that point, they looked at what the SPI was to incision and also postoperatively looked at which patient required a higher analgesic. Now, the titration of SPI was done with uh, sofentanil in this case, and they ensured that the SPI was maintained between 20 to 50. Now, this is what the recommendations are from the, uh, uh, you know, the product leaflet that we get. And personally, if you ask me, it does actually vary during a case when we have actually monitored enough. In fact, one of our DNB students is doing a study on the SPI and uh, the papers again are, uh, you know, it's not very conclusive that it's a good uh, indicator for pain, but definitely it does use an algorithm to predict pain. What are the inputs that the SPI takes in to come up with this number? I think it's mainly looking at the sympathetic response. So it is, it is mainly looking at how the body is responding to pain. And it takes the pulse rate, the uh, blood pressure changes, and th these criteria are used in a complex algorithm to come out with a number. Just like how the BIS would probably use the EEG and uh, the other parameters. Okay. So, uh, Murli, uh, you deal with a lot of these patients who have uh, chronic pain and they're coming in for surgery. And I think one of the easiest way to predict that somebody is going to give you trouble in the post office, seeing a patient come in for surgery, he's on a big list of medications, which includes, uh, say, a paracetamol, a pregabalin, a bit of NSID now and then, or even an opiate. Now, thankfully, we have regional anesthesia to rescue us. But how would you deal with such a patient pharmacologically, since Archana touched on that topic, and without using any RA? How would you deal with these patients? We've, we've seen these patients, you know, the time when we weren't very good with our blocks. 
yeah. had a patient already on the drugs which we were supposed to give him intraop he's already taken them in the morning <laughs> how do you deal with these guys in the post op now this is a, a quite a big issue in the western world now if you look at the opioid crisis which uh, has happened in the us and uh, majority of the western world uh, you tend to see a lot of patients coming in with huge doses of morphine 120 mg 200 mg now Uh, these are the cases which are challenging now in indian population we luckily don't tend to see patients on huge doses of opiates we do get them who are on amitriptyline duloxetine pregabalin and these patients who are not on opiates tend not to be of a big issue the main reason is with opiates you tend to have an opioid induced hyperalgesia and the withdrawal especially if they are with the npo status so one of the key drugs in managing them post operatively is ketamine now ketamine is a drug which can be used for such uh, patients with refractory pain and i tend to mix the ketamine with morphine when i'm using it for the pca or for you know their management post operatively and when i talk about the dosage of ketamine i'm not in, talking at 10 20 mg i'm talking at 1 2 mg so dilute the ketamine which probably comes at 50 mg per ml in a 10 ml syringe and give 1 ml now this has been shown to give very good you now re- results when it comes to these refractory patients now counseling doesn't work very well in these patients because they are already on these medications with uh, with a lot of pain so region anesthesia if there is an option should be our first option and if we are using regional anesthesia and these patients a perineural catheter and a continuous perineural block is something which i would choose and if there is no option to put a catheter for that site i'd probably add in some amount of adjuvant like dexamethasone so that we can prolong this analgesia through the first night of uh, or first day of the post operative period and we do continue all the medications that they are on and if they are on higher dose of opioids we will convert that into the iv formulation based on what kind of opioid they are on and how much of bioavailability it would have based on whether it's an oral or a transdermal patch and continue it post operatively uh dr murli yeah yeah i have a question uh, yes please uh it's uh, regarding about tkr patients okay coming yes. for knee replacement yeah uh, these patients usually they have got a element of chronic pain because of the yes. osteoarthritis and everything yes so post operatively uh, is there any role of apart from the multimodal anesthesia which we will give along with the regional anesthesia is there any role of uh, pre gabalin or gabapentin post operatively in the post operative pain management okay now Uh, the use of pregabalin uh, you know there is a lot of excitement in the 2000s when uh, you know lyrica was launched and what you could see papers on every aspect with regards to uh, use of pregabalin so from chronic pain neuropathic pain anxiety uh, preoperative post operative so there were multiple papers which came out during that time what we have found as uh, archana was mentioning uh, is there is not much of consensus with regards to post op pain now we do use it now it might have an anxiolytic effect it might have a opioid sparing effect but the main thing to note here is apart from the fact that it can cause dizziness and in some patients drowsiness or altered sensorium the side effect profile of pregabalin is not that dangerous so i would still we still use it in our protocol uh, up to 10 days and we have not found any major side effect using it well the beneficial effect has been noted when we use a good compound uh, of pregabalin from a good manufacturer and uh, this is something especially if the patients have been taking preoperatively should be continued and uh, the, right now the consensus with the the, the total knee replacement is that uh, the earlier studies did show a good improvement in uh, pain uh, scores but the recent studies have not been very conclusive I don't know whether uh, Archana agrees with this because she would have done more reading about this in the in the recent literature. I agree with you. Sir. It's the same thing that I not much consensus regarding how much we can use whether it works. Uh, Doctor Murli, I have one more question for you uh, regarding the tools which you uh, told about uh, uh, monitoring, uh, predicting the post-operative pain in your talk. 
what are the practical tools which we can use in our day to day practice right okay now you know surprisingly the first thing i would probably take is a psychosocial uh, tool now the reason is uh, patients who come from an educated background who have got information the right information i'm not talking about the googled information the right information from the surgeon or the anesthetist tend to be in a better position to handle the post operative pain they feel that they are in control of the pain now this is a very important uh, component especially when we go to see these patients post operatively because they know that they have options they are not panicking this is probably the first one which i would use as a predictor so if i see a patient who is uh, probably not willing to uh, they don't want to know much i would try to educate them and and tell them that these are the options you have these options and we can use it the second thing is pre operative pain scores so anybody who is having a higher anxiety level especially you will tend to see this with uh, the younger uh, ladies who come for surgeries uh, extremely anxious and giving them a good anxiolytic and reassuring probably goes a long way if they have got a lot of pre operative pain treating that aggressively again is important now coming to the quantitative sensory testing of all the tools which have been used it's the electrical pain threshold which has shown to have some relevance in predicting but as i told that you know with regards to tkr patients uh, the simple filament can be used to just check whether they have the sensitivity around the knee to pain so if they have higher sensitivity then we can probably be aggressive in the multimodal technique by using regional anesthesia regional analgesia post operatively and also adding opioids so being very aggressive especially in the first post op day uh, is quite important in any kind of uh, uh, pain management and the uh, other tool is simple tool of uh, venous cannulation so i did you know ask all my uh, you know residents as to whether they found this as a important tool and many of them would say because many of them are working for now four five years and they would say yes sir the person who screams when we put the iv cannula probably tends to have more pain post operatively so i think if you take the uh, message from this talk i think first would be the psychosocial element the next would be probably the venous cannulation the third is probably the education level that we give them in trying to kind of modulate and regarding region anesthesia it plays an extremely important role because you have this anxious patient you give them a shoulder uh, you know the shoulder surgery uh, intraskeletal block with probably a catheter in situ now the patient has has not experienced pain now the anxiety levels are completely different now you go see them post operative they are in fact more worried about the numb numbness now than the pain so uh, i think regional anesthesia plays a extremely key role and knowing when to use and when which patient to use will be very important thank you over to you neha for the next so uh, just uh, one more question to murli sir uh, sir any experience of patient control analgesia in these patients with who are coming with chronic pain like dealing with these uh, uh, patient control analgesia be it perineural or be it uh, iv or epidural okay now coming to patient control analgesia we probably need to change the protocol in patients who are on uh, higher opioids uh, pre operatively and we have to keep in mind that the the protocol that we have for normal patients might not be enough might not be enough so you will have the uh, time out for your uh, pca pumps you will have the bolus dose for the pca pumps these might not be enough for a patient with chronic pain so we will have to change the settings according to the patient and as i said adding ketamine will actually make a huge difference when it comes to pca now i don't have much experience using pcea uh, for post operative pain uh, so people who probably use it uh, you know if amjad has used it will be able to highlight but this is what i would probably change in these patients have you uh, used perineural pca like whatever uh, block catheter have you used no we we have not used uh, patient controlled uh, perineural catheters it will be perineural catheters with either uh, infusion pump running at a predetermined rate or boluses given by uh, the resident or the nurse so this is what okay, we have yeah. okay like fixed infusion not uh, pca sort of not pce not pc uh, a so uh, the uh, 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 dr murli yeah i'm just please 
Yeah, just to point that uh, what Murli said is we have been using a patient controlled uh, catheter boluses for a while now. It depends on what kind of pump you have and uh, what kind of patient profile you're having. So the simple thing that we have seen is the satisfaction is much better. Your infusion rates are much lower. And uh, these pumps can also be programmed to deliver a pre-programmed bolus. So for uh, catheters such as the erector spiny block, we've seen that uh, you know programming a bolus of say 20 ml or 15 ml works better than an infusion at times. So some of these pumps, depending on what you have, can be programmed in this way. Uh, it's always good to have the patient take control of their analgesia and participate in it. Uh, we've found that it works kind of well. Uh, there's one question for Murli on the chat box as to how you would score pain in non-communicative patients. That is, if you okay. have... Yeah, I know, I understood, yeah. So non-communicative, uh, see, the, uh, the, the pain's rating scales are designed mainly for communicative patients. So the VRS, the VAS, and uh, the other tools which we use. Now, the non-communicative patients would be uh, one children, uh, other patients with mental issues or even uh, patients in the ICU. Now, there are different tools for these patients and uh, this is another subject altogether, but there are tools which are available, easy to download, which can be used for these patients. And uh, most of them are based on the, the ICU patients, especially is based on their uh, physiological parameters. So it could be something like the heart rate, the blood pressure. So there are various tools for uh, scoring patients in the ICU. And for children, we know that there are the phaser scale and uh, the other simple tools which can be used for pediatric patients. Neha, there are some questions for us. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, about I, magnesium. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Rachana, there are a uh, few questions in the chat box. It's from uh, uh, like Dr. Aparna and Dr. Ramamurthy. They both have asked about the role of magnesium in acute post-operative pain. Uh, so, first of all, I'd like to actually thank them very much for asking this question. Um, when I looked up and I researched it, Magnesium, yes, it did have a role in uh, intraoperative management and it acts as a part of a multimodal therapy. Postoperative management, um, again, that's plus or minus. But in ICU sedation, yes, they do use it. Whether it is part of a multimodal regimen, again, it's yet to be seen. But I will disclose that I do use it sometimes for my patients, especially when they undergo general anesthetics. I, I haven't used it as an adjuvant, but definitely magnesium plays an important role, I found. And I, I'm happy with my patients in the post-operative period when I use uh, magnesium, especially in long duration surgeries and those patients who have you know, a lot of fluid shifts and all these sort of things, as long as they do not have renal issues, uh, I, I, I do like the profile of magnesium. So I thank you very much for asking me that question. And also there is one question about buprenorphine patch. Uh, so yes, transdermal patches are uh, available. You know, there are another option that are available. Even, you know, you have fentanyl also and you do have buprenorphine. But again, obviously the problem with the transdermal patches is, is, is the actual, you know, ability for it to deliver consistently and uh, you know the quality of the patch as such, and then the you know, integrity of the patch. Sometimes it is variable. So I used to use fentanyl patches, buprenorphine patches, uh, not a lot, but definitely uh, you know it uh, it is helpful. And I I do know surgeons who do uh, use buprenorphine patches. So you know they they are happy with it, and their patients are happy with it. So if you can give it IV and your transdermal works. If, if it's a feasible option, then yes, of course, buprenorphine patches would play a definite role. Uh, I've got a comment here, Ritesh, if I can make, yeah, yeah uh, both on magnesium and uh, the patches. Now, magnesium, as we know, works on the NMDA receptor and uh, ketamine works there as well. So uh, 
giving magnesium actually uh, has multiple benefits, especially if it's a patient undergoing a laparotomy or something major, because it has got a membrane stabilizing effect. It's good for preventing arrhythmias postoperatively. So, and the toxicity levels are difficult to reach if you're just giving one or two grams. So that probably is something which is safer to use when you have a sick patient. Now, coming to transdermal patches, uh, I am very much against it. The reason being, uh, these patches are designed for patients who already have some amount of opioid in the system. So using it on opioid naive patients, especially in the post-operative period is uh, not a licensed use of the drug. And also the problem with uh, buprenorphine is if they have respiratory depression related to it, it's not easy to reverse it with naloxone. Whereas if it's fentanyl, yes, there is an option of reversing it. The other issue is uh, with regards to their absorption. So by the time they reach the peak effect, uh, it takes uh, close to 12 to 24 hours and it's difficult to kind of assess whether the patch is making a difference. Uh, so as we have better tools, especially in the period, uh, period uh, I think patches is something that, uh, I know it's quite popular, people do use it, uh, especially a lot of orthopedic uh, surgeons uh, whom I kind of encounter tend to use it, but uh, I, I have my own reservations uh, based on this. And in the in the Western world, you would never see, uh, you know, in the UK or the US or any of the European countries, people using it for a perioperative uh, use. So I think that message is something that I wanted to kind of highlight. I agree with you, Murli. Uh, if you look at, I think, some of the literature on patches, it is definitely not recommended for acute pain. Uh, I think in our practice, where the patches would be useful is as a, sec, uh, as a step down. Suppose you're graduating from an epidural onto something else. Probably then, you know, you put it on the patch well before you stop the epidural and remove it that would be one use for it, but definitely not in the immediate post-op period, because as you said, you're looking at over 12 hours for onset of action of uh, fentanyl. I think buprenorphine is somewhere around the same time. 12 to 18 hours, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I don't see something, uh, you know, I think the surgeons put it on because it's e they have easy access to it. They probably cannot handle intravenous fentanyl or morphine. And uh, they find it easy to slap on a patch or two on uh, patients requiring it. Uh, Dr. Rajana, one more question is there. You are mute, Neha. You are mute, Neha. Yeah, uh, sorry. It's, uh, it's uh, for Dr. Rajana. Any particular intravenous lignocaine uh, infusion doses you prefer to go with? Yeah, intravenous lignocaine, um, I do not use it. Um, there are the you know, and I've also read about it, but you know, I do not have a personal experience to give you know, an actual dose uh, in terms of answering this question. Um, I think maybe any of the, you know, my other colleagues can maybe really better answer this because I, I honestly don't have an experience with intravenous lignocaine to tell you a definitive dose. Especially in the setting of post-operative pain management. Yeah. Uh, so, so most of the intravenous lignocaine uh, data comes from spine surgery patients, wherein uh, they've used it for uh, uh, spine surgery. And r right now, there is again a uh, poor consensus whether uh, lignocaine can be used because recent data is showing that it's not uh, very effective. Uh, the other important thing which probably is in the horizon is uh, newer NMDA antagonists, uh, which are being tried. So uh, something uh, less, uh, uh, with a less side effect profile of than ketamine, uh, there are newer drugs which are coming out. So that's a new space that we can watch out for. Uh, but lignocaine uh, infusions, we have tried. Now, I do tend to use lignocaine infusions at higher dose for uh, refractory neuropathic pains, uh, such as thalamic pain or, uh, you know, uh, phantom limb pain in chronic pain. But in the perioperative period, uh, initially there was excitement, but now I think people are have, have not uh, are not using it. Yeah, Amjad, Neha, I think we are done with all the questions. Uh, yes, we have covered almost all from it. Yeah. Any fear? 
Any more comments uh, from the two speakers, from the two moderators? I can see there is one comment about uh, uh, cerebral palsy children. I think uh, parental yeah. score. Yeah, uh, it's it's quite a tricky thing with uh, you know children with CP uh, and parents play a very vital role because they understand the child so well that if the child is in pain, they will be able to tell. I, I very much agree with this. Uh, probably this is related to the question of how we score in uh, patients who cannot communicate. So it is probably the same thing. And I very much agree that parents are one of the best judges when it comes to patients with CP. Yeah, we see there is one question uh, to both the speakers from Dr. Sudhatri. Uh, do you prefer injection ketamine Xylocard, dexamethasone, cocktail regimen for perioperative anesthesia. No, no, I, I yeah, no, uh, no, the cocktail is for, uh, is it? Yeah, no, I'm just trying to think whether it's a cocktail uh, for injecting close to the nerve or is it a IUE? So, and it will I work anyway. For IV. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's why it I, has been used. I, uh, it's a cocktail. I have heard of this, but uh, I, I have not used personally, but I've heard of this, that people are using this. Now, uh, let me tell one thing. Now, if we have to use dexamethasone as a sole analgesic, we have to go up to 20, 25 milligrams. Uh, 8 milligram, 4 milligram probably doesn't help in uh, analgesia. Xylocard, again, uh, you know, you wouldn't be touching the toxic dose of 4 or 5 milligram per kg body weight if you're giving it uh, perioperatively. And ketamine definitely has got a role. But again, the, the recent papers which are coming out are contradictory. So we get excited about something for a few years, we use it, and then comes the paper. It's like the, you know, POIS trial or any of the other things. We seem to go through a sign, kind of, a, uh, you know, up and down phase. So we get excited about, uh, we got excited about ketamine perioperatively. But again, now the papers coming out are telling that it doesn't make a huge difference. So it's like uh, the perineural dexamethasone and intravenous dexamethasone. People who have used it perineural know that it works better than intravenous, but we have data showing that they both are equal. So uh, I think there's no harm in using these medications if uh, we're using it in smaller doses and uh, in conjunction, probably they might make a difference. And even dexmedetomid and people use it. Uh, so, so there's no harm if you're using adjuvants or you know newer, newer medications in doses which will not cause harm. Uh, there is one more question regarding the use of lopertine. Uh, it's from Dr. Ram. The use of lopertine for post-operative pain. Any literature evidence? Um, and uh, Murli sir, for you, it's like a scoliosis, uh, scoliosis post-op pain management. What are the regimen you are following? Okay, I think Archana can take the lopertine when I can think about the answer for the scoliosis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, when it, I didn't find any evidence regarding lupertine, but as as my understanding stands, it's non-opioid analgesic, and you know it was there in the 2010-2013 kind of range. Um, it has a few. The side effect profile is is you know it causes liver toxicity and you know things. It has been used for acute and chronic pain conditions, but in the setting of acute post-operative pain management, uh, no, not much literature that, that Okay. So, uh, it has been used for preemptive analgesia, like uh, this is same for tapentadol also. I am aware of we have used uh, both the tapentadol and flupertin for preemptive analgesia, uh, but for post-operative pain, uh, like we have not continued in the post-op period, but it's a promising uh, upcoming drug I can suggest, maybe. Uh, I think just like uh, wisdom, the, the, there is something uh, you know, which about wisdom. The longer the, uh, the, the wisdom has been around, the better it will stay in the future. So I think with drugs which we have used for a longer time, I think we should probably stick to it rather than trying out new things because Tepentadol again can cause a lot of hallucinations and patients uh, can go into acute delirium. So that's my take on that. Now coming to uh, scoliosis uh, post-op pain, personally, uh, I have not done that number of uh, scoliosis uh, uh, you know, patients to kind of comment as an expert, but I do know that uh, epidural catheters which are placed uh, have got an excellent role. 
And uh, there are surgeons who actually place two epidural catheters if they're doing an ex extensive scoliosis surgery. And uh, this gives excellent pain relief. Uh, along with the multimodal techniques uh, that are used. So I don't know if anybody here has got experience with it, uh, you know, more than what I do, they can probably add uh, more to it. The uh, epidural catheters definitely help, Murli. The other thing that we added on was to use uh, a sort of LIA regimen where we injected into the, because the entire back is usually exposed and uh, expecting one epidural catheter to do the job is uh, a little bit of wishful thinking. So we used to use a bit of a LIA mixture cocktail, uh, which was injected very diligently into the dissected tissues, along with uh, keeping the epidural catheter for the post-op. This would help. Uh, of course, the usual regimen of uh, tried and tested drugs, as you may put it, uh, tends to work. It appears that, you know, there are so many drugs now available, but none of them seems to be game changers. Uh, game changers like, say, an intravenous paracetamol or a good old NSAID or uh, the opiates, the standard opiates that we use, the fentanyls and the morphines. None of the newer drugs seem to have uh, changed things too much. They're there. We hope that they're safe and uh, they could probably be used as, you know, as an adjuvant as mo at most. Now, one thing which I would like to highlight is more than the newer drugs, the empathetic doctor going and talking to the patient, explaining and doing a post-op round to see how your patient is doing probably will be a game changer if everybody starts doing it. Exactly. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I agree on that. Uh, one more question for uh, Dr. Archana is there. Uh, it's, it's from Dr. Vaishali. Which is the latest NSIs in Vogue? Um, honestly speaking, I think it's the same old drug. You know, even the newer drug. I, I, if you ask me a name in specific, I honestly don't know. Um, Simply because you know, I I don't really use a lot of the newer drugs. It's not available for us here, and uh, you know, cost is a lot of uh, issue. So uh, I I don't know. Maybe Modri said or any one of the other moderators could take this question. The best NSAID is the one that works. Exactly. I mean, whether it <laughs> use <laughs> which one? I think everybody has their favorite. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, if you want to give it intravenously, you don't have much choice. You have a diclofenac and you have yeah. Ketorolax. Yeah. Uh, if you want to give it orally, you can either give those or you can give ibuprofen. Uh, there's not much to choose from. I think all of us have our favorites. They kind of work almost the same. I mean, I don't think one NSAID is greater than the other. They have a little bit of their side effects. Uh, but yeah, I think all of us with the little conventional wisdom, we'll figure out which one to use on our patients. They're pretty much all the same, if you ask me. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you to the two speakers for a fantastic talk, Dr. Murli and Dr. Archana, for enlightening on the post-operative uh, pain management prediction, what are the tools, and uh, Ashna for enlightening on the new drugs and uh, Dr. Amjad and Dr. Neha for moderating the session very nicely. Thank you to all the delegates who attended this webinar and participated in the discussion part. Uh, thank you to Fusifilm Sonocyte. Thank you to Anesthesia TV and uh, See you all in the next webinar in the last Saturday of uh, September. Till then, take care. Bye-bye. Be safe. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you, Richard.